everybody. Salams and shalom. Welcome to our third in a five-part Facts Over Fear webinar series. We are honored to have you join us, and we also honor the indigenous land that we are on, wherever we may be in the United States. My name is Anila Afzali, and I am the Executive Director of the American Muslim Empowerment Network at the Muslim Association of Puget Sound. As I've said before, I am a recovering attorney. I left my legal career in 2013 after a spiritual transformation that brought me back to my faith. And since then, I've been working on bridge building and justice advocacy, including starting the Facts Over Fear series with my dear brother and partner in good, Reverend Terry Kylo. The Facts Over Fear series consists of five animated videos that we created to address the myths and misconceptions about Islam and Muslims. And if you missed the last two week sessions, one on the Islamophobia industry and the other on Islam and peace, you can watch the live streams on our Facts Over Fear Facebook page, as well as our Facts Over Fear YouTube and website, www.factsoverfear.org. This week, we're looking at Islam and what it actually teaches about women's rights. But before getting to Islam and women's rights, we wanted to set the stage with the other Abrahamic faith traditions, Judaism and Christianity. And we are truly blessed to have my dear two sisters, Rabbi Johanna Kinberg and Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown with us today as special guests. The three of us have done programming together under the name Daughters of Abraham because our three faith traditions have a shared ancestry with Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, among many other commonalities. And I have to add that these two sisters of mine are leaders in faith who inspire me with their words, their actions, their spirit, and also their generosity of time. Today, of course, is Sunday, so Reverend Dr. Kelly, she has her own faith services today, earlier today, and yet she's still gifting us here today with her time and her presence. And then tonight, Yom Kippur begins at sunset, the holiest day uh, in, Ju in Judaism. And we are blessed to have Rabbi Kinberg with us, even though she has a service starting right after this, so we'll have to leave early. Mar Hatima Tova to our Jewish siblings. May you be completely sealed for the best. Rabbi Kinberg, Reverend Dr. Brown, and I, we're going to have a brief conversation about women's rights and faith generally. That's going to be moderated by dear Reverend Terry Kylo, who I'm so honored to have join me every week for this series and to whom I'm going to pass it to now. Take it away, Reverend Terry. Thank you, Anila, and, and welcome everyone. And uh, my name is Terry Kylo. I'm the executive director of Paths to Understanding. I'm a Lutheran pastor and have been for about 30 years. I also have served in the Episcopal Church as well. And I'm just so happy to do this work with Sister Anila and try to be a, uh, a, a you know, part of a larger set of faith communities uh, counteracting religious bigotry. And I feel so strongly that people with religious connections and, and, and communities need to stand up for each other uh, and lift up our human rights, our, our religious diversity and, and the beauty of that and also lift up the freedom we have as American citizens to, to, have, uh, to, to participate or not participate in religion as we are called to do so. So I'm so happy to have um, Rabbi Johanna Kinberg, who is the rabbi of Kolomi and has been serving as such since 2014. Also the Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown, pastor of Plymouth Church of the United Church of Christ in Seattle, and of course, Sister Anila. And so I'd like to start off with you, Johanna, if you're willing. And and just to ask, what's been the trajectory of your faith tradition's understanding of the power and role of women? Thank you. Well, it's really nice to be here with you all. And I guess I take it back to the beginning, to Genesis, um, to the creation story, and um, thinking about the the binary that most of us see in the creation story, that there's Adam and Eve and there's a separation. Um, but interestingly, in, in, the, um, in Jewish tradition, from the first creation story, the one before Adam and Eve, the numbered one, first day, second day, um, it says that God made them, um, man and woman, together sort of as one. 
is the interpretation of the Hebrew, which means that the first human being, some ancient scholars speculate, was all genders. And so we have these two models in Judaism that we inherited, one very binary, but one very non-binary. Mm -hmm. And um, I can, you know, I trace throughout Jewish history that that very much exists and is alive. So that in, throughout the Torah, there are definitely binaries in terms of um, men and women having different roles, and some people, people would say special roles, um, unique to men and women, but then there's also other things that are sort of gender bendy that also exist within the, 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 the ancient text also, and that goes in through the Talmud, um, which in some ways further solidifies the binary by imposing um, greater um, ritualistic um, opportunities on women around the cleanliness of their bodies. So from biblical times moving forward, um, women um, were required to immerse around their menstrual cycle um, to be clean, to have relationships with their husband, to be clean, to even touch the same things as their husband. Um, and, and that was the same for seminal emissions in the Bible. But in the Talmudic times, it changed, and it became really that only that women were to go through a state of purity and impurity, purity and impurity. Men didn't really need to be touched. And so Jewish civilization moving forward from the Talmudic times forward really um, imposed greater binaries in some ways. But then on the other hand, culturally, there was also some gender bendiness in that men were encouraged to go study and women were to be in the workplace and support the family. So there's, there's always been sort of these two tracks. And where I, I land is when, you know, the year I was born, 1972, when I was in utero with my mom, um, I was at the ordination of the first female reform rabbi. Mm -hmm. And that was really a breaking of a structure in terms of starting with the leadership of the community, that both men and women can be, um, and people of all genders can be equal leaders in the community, have equal authority in um, discerning the law um, and being scholars and doing all the leadership. And then it sort of goes down from there in terms of the equalizing factors. And so while there is definitely a Judaism that's very binary, there also exists, and this is my reality, a post-patriarchal Judaism where we don't, we can, we can have a beautiful spiritual tradition and feel connected to God and our ancient texts without having to embrace a, binary, a gender binary. In fact, we can, we can live on that spectrum and see the beauty and it, it enhances our connection to the divine by understanding um, the beauty that is manifest from, from the holy source of life. So, you know, we, we, have, we have a lot of examples in Judaism of the roles of women, but I would say one, of, one example is that we've moved in many ways beyond gender. And um, I think that that is the future for a lot of liberal Jewish life. Thank you, Johanna. So, so Kelly, I'd like to ask you the same question. What has been the journey of your faith tradition's understanding of the power and role of women? Thank you so much for in, in, inviting me today. I'm so grateful to be here with my sisters, um, Rabbi Johanna and Sister Anila. Thank you for inviting me. When I was thinking about the question, the unfortunate thing is I feel like I need to speak to Paul first because I think that most Christians would um, have to um, deal with their thoughts that come from Pauline epistles, the letters to the churches first, because um, most often what you'll hear from, um, um, I wanna say perhaps uh, growing and, and um, pulpits is that uh, women should be silent, that um, women um, are, should submit to their husbands, all of these sort of restrictive views of women that most certainly came by way of the writings of Paul or, or writings that were attributed to Paul. But I want to offer today that we should look at the central figure of, the, um, of Christianity, which is Jesus and his engagement with women. Because Jesus um, most certainly discipled women and created apostles of women. Jesus most certainly spoke theology with the woman at the well. 
And even though she was ostracized and um, did not, was not a part of the community in the usual way, Jesus had a very deep theological conversation with her. I am thinking about two sisters where Jesus um, defended the sister who preferred to sit and listen and speak with Jesus rather than do the things um, that are tasks usually attributed to women. And so what I believe is that we, the Christianity has diminished what one of the most important things that Jesus was doing, which was to liberate women and to stand over and against the binary that our, our dear rabbi spoke about that is so um, in many ways lazy and has been perpetuated over the course of many um, years and millennia simply because um, of the inability to let go of patriarchy. And I would say it's also features very strongly in white supremacy. And so for me in this day where we are um, beset with the images of women in cages locked away um, being sterilized in a time where we are, are afraid because of the death of our dear uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We're afraid of the rolling back of Roe versus Wade and many of the other women's rights that have been um, fought for by the, the blood, sweat, and tears of women, but also those who are co-conspirators with women. It is important for us to say that we are in sin if we are not liberating, freeing, and exalting women in leadership and in roles that will acknowledge the fact that women not only hold up half the sky, but we are the holders of faith. We are the ones that were not afraid in the Christian context when others scattered, the women stayed, and they were the ones to witness um, the death and resurrection of Jesus in the Christian context. And so somehow there has to be this um, um, recalling and unearthing of um, the roles of women in our current society, in our current faith. And as um, also Rabbi Yo um, Johanna lifted up, it's unfortunate in, in many regards and fortunate, I was also born in 1972, it's unfortunate that we're still having firsts, right? As many of us on the, who are here today are our firsts. And so um, we need to acknowledge that the um, inability for us to set free women uh, theologically, ideologically, and in so many other ways has not only um, been burdensome and harmful to women, but also to all of us as we are the holders of community in particular ways. And so I'm hoping that this conversation will be um, a healthy collusion of story to say that now is the time for us to let go of some of the habits of systems and uh, oppression that we have uh, held so tightly over women. Thank you so much, uh, Kelly. And Anila, I'd like to inv invite you to answer the same question. Um, how has your faith traditions had a journey around the understanding of the power and role of women? Sure. I always love hearing from the rabbi and the reverend because I can relate in a lot of ways. Uh, with the rabbi's comments, I can relate to sort of the two perspectives, one uh, sort of that is uh, promoted by certain people and another one that's very different that I find uh, more real and more authentic and that really promotes the liberation of women in Islam. Uh, and when I look at the journey of, of Islam with respect to women's rights, I find so many beautiful and empowering and uplifting examples of women and the role that they played in society and even with the religion, uh, and it's very contrary to the message that we are told oftentimes, especially with the Islamophobia industries narrative. And then when I hear the reverend speak, uh, specifically this idea of what Jesus, peace be upon him, taught, similar to what Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught, being very different from what people might do in their names. Uh, and that is a reality that we are facing. And the whole journey of sort of what Islam teaches and, and speaks about when it comes to women's rights, I'm actually going to go into in much more detail later on when I do a, a, a little presentation on Islam and women's rights. So in the interest of time, I'm actually going to stop right there and address more of that later on because uh, it's, I think it'll be um, eye-opening for a lot of people, especially if the only narrative they've heard is the one promoted by those who are anti-Muslim. Yeah, thank you, Anila. And so the, the next question that we kind of want to grapple with is this one, and all of you have mentioned it, that 
that uh, many people have misconceptions about about gender and the role of women in general um, from within with, from within your traditions. And so I'd like to start with Kelly, if I could this time. And what are some of the stereotypes about the role of women in your faith tradition? And how do you dispel that disinformation? How do you how do you respond to that? Thank you. One of the most um, impactful memories I have of my um, just over 20, 28 years of ministry is I was preaching in Richmond, Virginia in a small church called Woodville Presbyterian. And a gentleman walked in uh, while I was preaching. He was marching back and forth on the back of the small sanctuary and he was being disruptive. He was coughing, he was barking, he was making loud noises while I preached. And so at the end, you know, you can make the assumptions that he was mentally ill. But however, um, I had a conversation with him afterwards. And he told me that I was an abomination, that there was not, according to our scriptures, women were not to um, instruct men that I was in sin by being a pastor and that the whole church was going to basically implode because of the sin that I was committing. And I had a conversation with him and besides the, um, the con concerns and issues that he had personally, I basically heard the animation of what has been happening in the Christian church for many years. I was not taking it personally, nor did I vilify him personally because he was speaking precisely what so many churches have spoken over the years where I can go to preach in another church other than my own and be invited to stand on the floor to speak from a podium rather than go on to the altar and speak from the pulpit because I simply am a woman and what I have learned is that I don't have the strength or the energy in this lifetime to struggle against that head on. So what I do is I keep preaching. And what I do is I keep writing. What I do is I continue to be a wedge for women in leadership. And what I do is I have created opportunities for women around me and beside me to stand shoulder to shoulder. And what I've also done is taught men that decentering maleness um, or anything that is re regarded masculine is um, actually discipleship and learning to share voice with those who have perpetually been silenced is absolutely what God is calling for us to do. And so that's how I live. That's how I have any bit of sanity in the midst of the uh, enormous um, voice to tell me to be quiet to submit to my husband, which I don't have, to, to slither away, I continue to thrive and live and be resilient in the face of all that oppression. Well, Dr. Kelly Brown, thank you so much for your leadership and your perseverance and your clarity around that, that too. Um, I'm, I'm humbled to hear it, sister. Um, and I just wanna raise the same question to, to Rabbi Johanna. Um, what are some of the stereotypes you face uh, from people in the larger society about the, the role of women and the power of women in Judaism. How do you deal with it? Yeah, I think, it, you know, in many ways it goes back to um, my response to the first question, which has to do with the binaries, which is there's a stereotype of Jews, which is that the most identifiable Jews are the ones with, who wear distinct dress. Therefore, that's sort of what is authentic Judaism, and that you can identify by, by looking at a, what a, you know, an Orthodox Jewish woman looks like an Orthodox Jewish man. Therefore, that's what Judaism is. While there's the majority of Jews on this planet don't necessarily wear distinctive garb, um, and so then things become much more um, complicated because people, um, again, have expressions of themselves in a variety of different ways. And this can really be seen with, um, I think it was the Guardian's article about Ruth Bader Ginsburg stated that she had abandoned Judaism. Um, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg never abandoned Judaism. There's pictures of her giving sermons and leading services at her overnight camp as a teenager. She, um, you know, was was very connected to Judaism, but she didn't she didn't she didn't fit the mold. Even for people who are progressive and looking, that she must have abandoned her faith because she no longer, um, you know, 
wore distinctive dress or fit the binary, basically. Um, and so that, I think that for myself, that's just as a, as a progressive Jewish woman, um, you know, that I am a woman of faith um, and that that is, um, that that within itself is often not acknowledged. Just the, 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 you know, how can you be pious if you're not wearing, you know, certain clothing um, or living a certain way? So, um, on the other hand, you know, within Jewish life, there have been many women who were religious, who were also able, um, like in Christianity and Islam, to advance in their careers. And um, even as women who did wear distinctive garb. So there's also that too, is that wearing, you know, um, the binary within Judaism doesn't necessarily limit you from um, excelling in the secular world. It just limits you from excelling in a certain way in the religious world um, in terms of, in, in, you know, there, certain things are not allowed. Um, so, I, you know, I'm very um, delighted. You know, there's, there were two, there, there used to be two Jewish women on the United States Supreme Court. And, you know, I think that that, that makes me very um, delighted as, um, as a Jewish woman and even more delighted is how many young women Ruth Bader Ginsburg inspired of all backgrounds um, and I just feel proud that people, that she was a Jew and that people know that this amazing woman was also a Jewish woman and that that was really a big part of who she was. Um, and today, you know, now that I'm in my late forties, it's a little bit easier as a, as a female leader, but you know, when I was in my thirties, when I was younger, it was very hard. People used to ask me after high holidays, if I wrote my own sermons or if I purchased them on the internet. It happened year after year after year because they couldn't fathom <laughs> that came out of <laughs> the mind that, that inhabits <laughs> this body. Um, and so um, I just, go, I looked back through my Facebook memories and I remember writing, someone again asked me if I wrote my own sermons this year. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. So that's, that's what comes with, with, with becoming, I guess I'm, I'm croning is what, is what is the appropriate term for that. And um, I'm, ex you know, and I'm excited to be the, you know, a, a, one of the first generations of, you know, elder female rabbis. It's that's so interesting to, that. to me, Rabbi, that, that the conversation is that if, if one wears traditional religious garb, then the larger culture, you know, tries to pigeonhole you and, and dismiss, you know, and if you don't, the larger right. culture also yes. uh, pigeonholes and dismisses. It's, it's uh, fascinating. I mean, that sad. happens to women, I think, in many, many situations. Yeah. It tends to be lose-lose, but we're, we're aiming for win-win moving forward. <laughs> amen, amen. So, uh, so Anila, how do you deal with all of the stereotypes and, and what are some of those stereotypes? How do you deal with that? Sister. Well, there are so many stereotypes, unfortunately, about Islam and women's rights, partly why we need to do this series uh, and this session in particular. And again, I will go into a little bit more about that uh, later on. But I will say that for me, you know, when I, the more I learned about Islam, the more empowered I felt and the more like beautiful examples I was seeing, including people who literally challenge women, who challenge the ruler of the Muslim community at the time, people who challenge Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him even, uh, because Islam teaches us to ask questions and to advocate for justice and fight oppression anywhere we see it or any form of injustice. So I find numerous examples of this. I find beautiful things like, you know, Mary, mother of Jesus, peace be upon them both, uh, being uh, named in the Quran by, you know, given a, a chapter dedicated to her and her story there and she being a model for men and women. I see examples of uh, people around the world, it doesn't matter if you are a ruler ruler of a country, if you go to do the pilgrimage to Mecca, which is one of the highest forms of our religious worship, you have to follow in the footsteps of a woman and remember what a woman went through in order to have your pilgrimage accepted. So I find so many of these kinds of beautiful examples that contradict the, the stereotypes, the misinformation that's promoted, not just by the anti-Muslim industry, but also by men usually, unfortunately, who are self-interested, who are seeking power, who want sort of their 
own interpretations uh, to be the law rather than the reality of what actually exists in Islam and in the Quran. And what I actually did, I remember with reading the Quran, I had a lot of lack of knowledge. I myself didn't know. And when you have tr uh, only translations and you don't have the actual Arabic, it's really hard sometimes to understand the true meaning of text. So I actually started putting post-its on all the places that I wasn't sure about the meaning or I had, I was like, that doesn't seem to make sense because it goes against the love, justice, and mercy that I believe God uh, is the manifestation of and, and I believe will show up in the scripture as well. So I put post-its on those and when I learned about more about each of those verses that I had put a post-it on, slowly these post-its started coming off as I resolved within my, myself a better, deeper understanding and even appreciation for some of the context for uh, some of these verses. So uh, that's sort of the way I see it is like there's one narrative that you can believe if you want to believe a certain uh, perspective about Islam or any of our faith traditions. And then there's another one that's far more beautiful, far more enlightening, and far more with what I believe is in line with, with God and what God wants for us. And in the work that I do, you know, ask me about my hijab, ask me about this kind of like these kinds of sessions going around and helping educate people about Islam uh, and building the kind of relationships uh, and understanding about a, a faith that is really being demonized for political uh, gain and, and profit, sadly. So I just want to thank again, uh, Rabbi Johanna and, and, uh, and Pastor Kelly Brown. Thank you so much for, for sharing what you shared with us today. And I just, I, I just want to say for my own self, you know, I, I learned that when Mary sat, sat at Jesus' feet, um, that meant that she was being accepted into his rabbinical school. And Jesus is willing to risk his life and his reputation for the leadership of women. And therefore, it's incumbent on men and the systems and institutions of church uh, and whatever religions are, are, are there to, uh, to, to do the same, to follow that practice so that we can all be whole together. Um, so again, thank you both for, for being here. We're gonna all watch a video now on Islam and women's rights. And it'll just take me a second here to share the screen and get all that stuff going. But again, we thank Rabbi Johanna and, and uh, Kelly Brown for being with us and hope, hope that they have a great day today. And here's the video that we created. What does Islam teach about women's rights? There is a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to this topic, so thank you for asking this question. Did you know that Islam granted a package of women's rights 1400 years ago that was unparalleled for over a thousand years in other parts of the world? Prophet Muhammad taught his followers that the best of them were those who treated women well. He further described men and women as committed partners and helpers to each other, and he himself sought the advice and counsel of women and even appointed women to positions of power, like Shafa bint Abdullah, who he appointed as supervisor of the market or minister of finance. As a result of Islamic teachings, Muslim women were in the marketplace, in the medical field, in positions of scholarship, and more. Muhammad even told his followers, women and men, to learn from his wife, Aisha. And there have been thousands of other great female Muslim scholars and jurists throughout history. In fact, the first university in the world was even built by a Muslim woman in the year 859. Muslim women are surgeons, entrepreneurs, politicians, teachers, lawyers, and more. American Muslim women are the second most highly educated religious community in our country. Like me, I'm a Harvard Law School educated attorney who made partner at a law firm and served as general counsel before leaving my legal career to pursue service. There are American Muslim women like Ibtihaj Muhammad and Dalila Muhammad who have brought home Olympic medals for Team USA. Say. There are American Muslim women who are in Congress now, like Representatives Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, and even outside the U.S., several Muslim-majority countries have even had female heads of state, like Sheikh Hasina, who is the longest-serving prime minister in Bangladesh. Unfortunately, in many parts of the world, and even here in our own country, women have faced and continue to face oppression and misogyny. 
in Muslim majority countries, such injustice is not because of Islamic teachings, but rather despite Islamic teachings that sought to liberate and empower women, as well as all of humanity. Such injustice is because of power dynamics, poverty, warfare, colonialism, post-colonialism, lack of education, bad translations, and more. We agree that women's rights should be upheld, so let's work together to combat misogyny and the patriarchy, but without attacking and demonizing the religion of over 1.7 billion people in the world, especially when that religion could actually help uplift and empower women as it has done and continues to do. So thank you all for watching that video, and, and we know Kelly and Johanna had to go, but we're again so grateful for them. And Anila, now I just invite you to help us uh, learn more about Islam and women and help us understand this. And there is a couple of, are a couple of questions in the Q&A that I know that, that we'll get to. Wonderful. So well, take it away, Anila. Thank you so very much, dear Reverend Terry. Uh, and I have to say thank you to everybody for joining us, especially today. Uh, you all know I'm a huge Seahawks fan. I know the Seahawks game is happening right now. So thank you for being with us. Uh, and I am so excited to talk about actually what is one of my favorite topics, women in Islam. Uh, unfortunately, as, as I said before, there's so much misinformation out there about what Islam teaches with respect to women. So I always appreciate the opportunity to share a very different perspective than what most people hear regularly through mainstream media, Hollywood, and so much more. And I want to start with a disclaimer that I am not a scholar, a religious scholar, but I love talking about women in Islam because women's rights has always been a passionate and personal topic of interest for me. I grew up in a family with three sisters and two brothers and, and of course my mom so lots and dad so lots of women in my family. Uh, I considered myself a feminist early on and would challenge cultural or other norms that seem to apply double standards to men and women, even as a little girl. And in college, I was a strong advocate for justice and also worked at the Women's Center as the diversity coordinator, where I was able to advocate for women's rights and address specifically the intersection of gender with race and religion. So I understand women's liberation and empowerment. And after a comparative religions course in college, looking at world religions and my own study, I personally chose Islam as the right religion for me. And this was in large part because of what I considered its empowerment of, of women, and I still have that view. But while I chose Islam with my mind in college, faith had not yet really moved my heart. That didn't happen until my spiritual transformation much later in life that I've talked about before. But since my spiritual transformation, I have personally witnessed and experienced the positive change that Islam has had on me and my family members, especially my brother and my father, when it comes to the, their views and treatment of women. This, of course, again, is in stark contrast to the views that are spread by the Islamophobia industry, which spends millions of dollars each year to demonize Islam and Muslims in the minds of our fellow Americans. And one of the most common topics that they use is actually uh, women's rights. So let's talk about some facts when it comes to Islam and women's rights. And to do that, I am going to try to share my screen here and hope it all works uh, the way it's supposed to. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's working. It's working? All right. But what I do want to uh, do is this. Sorry, please forgive me here. Some of the... I'm so sorry. I... I I worry that this was going to happen, and I do apologize there. Let me try one more time. Let's try this. Um, I'm so sorry here. Don't worry, sister. Okay. I'm going to try it one more time. And I'm, of course, having problems now. Uh, okay. We were able to see the screen, just so you know. 
you were, then I think yes. I'm just having difficulty on my end. Let's see. Are, are you still able to see it or no? We're not able to see it right now because I think you've stopped the screen share. Okay, let me try that one more time. Um, all right. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes, I can. Okay, wonderful. So sorry, everybody, for that. Uh, but I want to go ahead and get started talking about Islam and women's rights and not the fiction and fear mongering that unfortunately we often hear. But before I begin, there's two important points that I want us to keep in mind. Uh, first, what you see happening in some Muslim majority countries or by some individual Muslims is not necessarily the same as what Islam teaches or what Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, taught. And then second, there's so much diversity in the Muslim population. There are almost 50 mu uh, different Muslim majority countries and about 80 countries where Muslims make up a sizable minority of 10% or more. So we cannot talk about Muslims as a monolith. And to understand women's empowerment in Islam, we need to have a better understanding of the situation before Islam. During pre-Islamic Arabia, with the exception of a tiny minority of wealthy women, the overwhelming majority of women in 7th century Arabia did not have rights and were treated like property, just like in other parts of the world at that time. And Islam came and revolutionized the status of women with a package of rights 1400 years ago, which was unheard of at that time and for many centuries thereafter. You heard some of these in the video, including things like the, the right to own and sell property, the right to own and run a business, the right to enter into legal contracts, including the marriage contract, the right to divorce, child custody, education, the right to participate in public affairs, to seek protection under the law, and so much more. Prior to Islam, the marital gift paid by a man was given to a girl's father as part of the contract between two men. The Quran changed that entirely, declaring that women needed to have a say and consent to the marital contract so they have a choice and that the marital gift belongs to the woman herself as a gift, as an individual, not to her father. Before Islam, the cultural practice was that when a man died, his brothers would inherit his wives. That abominable practice was uh, abolished by the Quran. This idea of inheriting women was completely abolished. Instead, the Quran actually extended women inheritance rights. Now, generally speaking, and not in all cases, but generally speaking, uh, the Quran does prescribe half as much inheritance for women as men. But that's because the Quran places financial responsibility directly on men that women do not have. Any money that I make is mine and mine alone. I can do whatever I want with it. But any money that a man earns or inherits goes to support his family, whether his wife, children, mother, sisters, or others. So my money is my money, but his money, whether it's my father, brother, uh, uncle, whoever, a husband, whoever it might be, is our money. And if you look at it that way, you see that the rules about inheritance, uh, even when they are in half, do not necessarily hurt women. And in fact, there are scenarios where men and women get equal shares and also scenarios where women get more. They are complicated rules of inheritance. But Muhammad, peace be upon him, was active in helping around the house, even doing what people consider, you know, quote unquote, women's work. And you know what? In Islam, a woman is not required to do housework. In fact, there's a great story about Umar al-Khattab, may God be pleased with him, who was the second leader of the Muslim community after Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, passed away. A man one day came to Omar to complain about his wife. And while that man was waiting for Omar, he heard Omar's wife scolding him. And Omar was quiet, not answering back. So the man turned around and started walking away. And at that moment, Omar came out and then said, you know, what is it that you want? And the man said, oh, leader of the believers, I came to complain to you about my wife's bad temper and how she nags me. Then I heard your wife doing the same to you. And Omar replied lovingly, oh, my brother, I bear with her because of her rights over me. She cooks my food, bakes my bread, washes my clothes, breastfeeds my child. And yet none of these are her duty. And then she is a comfort to my heart and keeps me away from forbidden deeds. 
Consequently, I bear with her. And Omar advised the man to also be patient with his wife. Muhammad, peace be upon him himself, he first married Khadija, may God be pleased with her, a wealthy merchant when he was 25 years old. And Khadija had actually hired Muhammad to do some work for, for her. So she was his boss and 15 years older than he was. And she had been married before three times and even had children already. And she proposed to him. And yet Muhammad's marriage to Khadija was a beautiful example. It was monogamous for the entire 25 years that they were married, something that was very rare in Arabia at that time. And by all accounts, they were deeply in love and Khadija became the first convert to Islam and Muhammad's confidant and advisor throughout their marriage. Even after Khadija passed away, Muhammad would honor and remember her with such love and affection and would even continue to give gifts to her friends in memory of her. And Islam in general prescribes the kind treatment of women. The Quran specifically describes the marital relationship as one of love, mercy, and tranquility, even as one of God's beautiful signs. There's this verse in the Quran that is often quoted even uh, in, in, in wedding ceremonies. You know, this idea that God created us all from one, from one source and created mates so that there can be that love, that affection, and the mercy, that that's a sign. The Quran commands husbands even to live in kindness with their wives, even at times that they may not be uh, happy with them or they may dislike them. Uh, and even when going through a divorce, a time of such hardship between a couple, even then a man is commanded to treat his wife with kindness and fairness. This is part of the teachings in the Quran specifically for, for forever. Muhammad, peace be upon him, also taught his followers the importance of kind treatment, of treating women well, that the best of them were those who were best to their women. He further taught that girls and women may be a pathway to paradise even. For example, oops, I don't know what happened there. For example, he told one man that if he educated and raised his four daughters well, that that would be his pathway to paradise. And another man who was nearby and heard this and said, hey, what about me? I only have three daughters. And the prophet, peace be upon him, said the same for you. That if you raise and educate those daughters, you, if you do that well, that can be your pathway to paradise. He also taught his followers that paradise lies at the feet of your mother. And when he was asked by a man who is the most worthy of his kindness and companionship, the prophet answered, your mother. The man said, then who? He said, your mother. Then who? Third time, your mother. Then who? Fourth time, finally, the prophet said, your father. As one religious scholar noted, if this were the Olympics, the woman would win the gold, silver, and bronze, and the man would walk away with, you know, consolation prize, maybe. <laughs> In his final farewell sermon, Muhammad, peace be upon him, told the men as parting words that he left them with, among other things, he specifically told them that uh, you, it is true that you have certain rights over women, but they have certain rights over you. And he described women as partners and committed helpers. This is this idea of partnership and equality. In fact, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was even criticized as being too pro-woman. And the traits that he embodied and valued are far more often, you know, what we consider feminine traits, mercy, compassion, love, gentleness, humility, and more. He even described the strong person not as somebody who's physically able to wrestle somebody down, but the person who's able to restrain their anger in a moment of sort of emotional rage. And this is why some people have even called him the first feminist. In this article, uh, Jim Garrison uh, wrote in the Huffington Post, of all the founders of the great religions, Buddhism, Christianity, Confucianism, Islam, and Judaism, Muhammad was easily the most radical and empowering in his treatment of women. Arguably, he was history's first feminist. Now, you can disagree with that, but I'm saying that there's this different perspective than the one that is often promoted and heard by so many, including the one that's promoted by the anti-Muslim industry. And I will say that as a result of the revolutionizing impact of Islam, we have so many examples of amazing women in all sectors of society in the early years of Islam and thereafter. 
For example, there were women in the marketplace, as you heard in the video. There were female scholars. The number of female Muslim scholars is so incredible that one man, Dr. Muhammad Akram Nadwi, he decided to write a book on female Muslim scholarship, thinking he'd write about, you know, 30 to 40 women. But as he studied, the number of female scholars he encountered kept growing to the point that he had over 8,000 biographical accounts, and he published a 40-volume collection. And we have people like Aisha, uh, may God be pleased with her, who was the wife of Prophet Muhammad, uh, who Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, even told his followers to take their religion from her after him. And after Prophet Muhammad's death, Aisha became a teacher of men and women about Islam. There are many others who taught men and women, including Um al-Darda, who as a young woman used to sit with male scholars in the mosque and even said how, sh how she never found a better way to worship God than by sitting around debating with other scholars. She became a teacher of religious sciences and rulings, and one of her students was the ruler of Damascus. Can you imagine a ruler coming to study and learn at the feet of a woman? The first university in the world, as you heard in the video, was established by a Muslim woman. There were Muslim women who fought in the battlefield, like Khawla bin Hakim, who fought in several battles to defend uh, Muslims at the time who were facing oppression. And one time she was the only one who was out there protecting Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and was recognized for her courage and fierceness. Muslim women practiced medicine, like Rufayda bin Saad, who was recognized as the first Muslim nurse and female surgeon in Islam. And she treated men and women. And there are so many more. I mentioned earlier, there was a woman who challenged the ruler, Omar, in a public setting. And Omar even recognized that she was right and he was wrong and admitted as much. And one of the earliest advocates for, uh, for women's rights was Nuseiba bin Kab al Ansaria. She specifically asked Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, why the Quran directly addressed men, but not women. Now, the way that is written in the Arabic, the, the form used for men includes women, just like in the Spanish language. But still, she wanted something specifically addressing women. And because of her question, God even responded with one of the most beautiful verses in the Quran. This is Quran uh, chapter 33, verse 35, which explicitly acknowledges the equality of women and men and highlights the, qual the qualities that make either men or women uh, successful in this life. And this is sort of the, the believing men, the obedient men and women, the truthful men and women, the you know, patient men and women, the humble ones, the fasting ones, uh, the modest ones, all of this, this is sort of this beautiful verse. And if we had time, I would actually play this uh, but because it's a very powerful uh, verse when you actually listen to it. But in any case, this is this idea that men and women are equal before God. And Muslim women today, you know, you heard about it in the video, heads of state in a dozen Muslim majority countries, Olympic medalists, congresswomen now in our country as well. And American Muslim women are the second most highly educated religious community in the, in the U.S. because knowledge is incumbent on men and women in Islam. And in fact, something that's unique about the American Muslim community is that there is no wage gap between American Muslim men and American Muslim women, which is actually very unique for a religious community. Now, let's be clear. I'm not at all saying that all Muslim women are liberated or empowered. They aren't, sadly. Nor are all Western women liberated or empowered, sadly. I'm also not denying the sad reality that people have and continue to use religion to justify their horrible oppression of women. Whether that religion is Islam or Christianity or Judaism or other faiths. You heard some of this earlier with the rabbi and a reverend who joined us. This has been true throughout history and there are people who continue to do that today as well, here in our country and in other countries. But the oppression of women that we may see around the world, including in Muslim majority countries, is not because of Islam, but because of the very same patriarchy, misogyny, and oppressive cultural practices that existed before Islam. And the oppressive practices that we see today are despite the teachings of Islam. They are, in fact, a return to pre-Islamic ignorance, even. And the reasons for this in Muslim majority countries are similar to the reason women around the world historically have faced and currently face oppression, regardless of their religion, regardless of their country even. Poverty, lack of education, illiteracy, bad translations of religious texts, politics, warfare, destruction of institutions, power dynamics, and more. And I want to ask you to think about something. 
if Islam or the Quran disappeared tomorrow, do you think the oppression of women in Muslim majority countries or anywhere would suddenly stop? Of course not. Islam, in fact, came to elevate and liberate women and define them as independent agents with free will. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was centuries ahead of the men of his time in his attitudes toward women. But unfortunately, right after he died, men started rolling back his reforms. And ever since then, people have promoted what is in their self-interest at times. And this is why we have some very fundamentally flawed even interpretations of different Quranic verses or sayings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And we've also had colonialism, post-colonialism, warfare, economic devastation, and so much more that has really impacted many of the countries today in the Middle East and elsewhere. But bottom line, and I'm gonna close on this, is that Islam truly came, just like I believe Christianity and Judaism, to liberate people to free us from the shackles of this world, regardless of gender or race or class. And unfortunately, while Muslims are not always the best practitioners of Islam, just like you know, Christians are not always the best practitioners of what Jesus, uh, peace be upon him, taught, I personally even believe that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would roll in his grave if he were to see some of the injustices done in his name. But despite all of that, despite the pollution and even perversion of religious texts and religion by some, I and millions of women around the world still find empowerment in Islam and a deep commitment to women's liberation and the liberation of all of us. And in fact, female converts from the Western world to Islam outnumber male converts four to one. Now, lots of people are surprised by that statistic because of the massive amounts of misinformation about Islam and, and women. But when you learn some of the facts, the history, the reality, and the possibility for a very different narrative from the one that is promoted, it, it makes a little bit more sense. So again, I'm not saying that to, to proselytize in any way. You can disagree with Islam. You can even critique Islam. That's welcome. But if we are fully committed to women's rights, as I am, as I hope you all are, then let us work together, as we ended in the video, let us work together to challenge the injustices, including combating misogyny, rather than attacking attacking one religion unfairly, especially when a religion actually can and has, even in our time, uh, liberated people and helped in, in different places around the world. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater and let's work together to make sure we achieve justice and liberty for all of us. And I will stop there. And let me stop the share. Thank you so much, Anila. And I'm, I'm just gonna sh share a few things here. Um, First of all, that as I've been doing this work for the last four or five years, I've found quite a bit uh, of liberal Islamophobia. And, and often that liberal Islamophobia kind of takes two forms. Um, one is that it's kind of, that there's a, that there is a strain within Western society of sort of anti-religion. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of complex history there that we'd have to talk about. Um, one of the books that I've been really informed by is a book called The Myth of Religious Violence by William T. Kavanaugh. And this highly researched book helps to explain some of the sources of some of the anti-religious bigotry that, that is within the United States. But the other thing that overwhelmingly comes up is this whole issue of Islam and women. And, uh, and, and many, many people you know, seem to think that if someone chooses to wear some religious garb, like we talked about with Rabbi Johanna, for instance, that somehow women are being oppressed because they're making a free choice. And Anila will have time to address some of that later. But it's, it really is fascinating how, how easily progressive folk tend to, to soak in and repeat uh, some of the, the, the lies of the Islamophobia industry with regard to Islam and women. So next I'm gonna take on about seven or eight minutes here to talk about messaging and how we talk to people uh, who have been captivated by fear. And I'm just gonna review a few things first and uh, start a screen share here and, and then we'll get going. So, so first off, you know, I just wanna remind everybody about dangerous speech and mass violence as we've been talking about and how basically what happens that the us and them becomes you know, full of uh, dehumanization of the other, collective blame and a threat and then people become fearful. And then what happens is that then we begin to believe as a society or as people that violence against that group is necessary and even good. And this of course is horrifying 
right, that any of us could be convinced that violence against the group based on lies and propaganda uh, is, is necessary or good. But then let's think back for the last 500 years. People were convinced that indigenous people's land should be taken from them, that it didn't belong to them, that they were less than human. We've been taught for 500 years in this country that African-American people could be enslaved and that that was in fact their proper place. Like that's what people said. Isn't that in fact a kind of violence? It certainly is. So we've already been the victims of dangerous speech and it's already led us to mass violence. And that's like sobering and difficult to take in, even for me saying it. So I just want to remind us that like this process of dangerous speech about a group is hardly new. And in fact, it's so easy for us to build off those other otherings, that other dangerous speech that we are easily susceptible to the dangerous speech toward new groups, including Muslims. So we talked last time about our challenges that we face, a uh, fear that people experience, that people have moral intuitions more than they have like cognitive thought that leads to our decisions. We, we have confirmation bias. We have a lot of in-group, out-group bias. Um, we got to remember that when we're talking with people, we want to try to reach persuadable people and not get focused on trying to convince people who are unreachable or part of the opposition, because that's just a waste of energy. And then when we're talking about, mess about messaging, what we want to help you understand is that you always want to think about the person that you're talking to and try to figure out what values you share in common. Share some positive stories about the group that's being othered, in this case, American Muslims, and then follow that up with information like from the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, because they do a really great job of, of studying American Muslims, what they believe and what they do. And remember that the change process that we engage in with people is really based a lot on relationships. And, but the problem is Muslims can't make up uh, 100 friends and probably keep that up over the course of their lifetime. So that's why allies like myself are so important for helping people to calm down and begin to recognize the way that this dangerous speech has begun to infect them. And then when we work together for the common good, that can really change hearts and minds. So let's imagine that you're talking to a person who has kind of soaked in from the larger culture, from the Islamophobia industry and the hate groups, a lot of negative stereotypes and negative attitudes against our Muslim neighbors. Like, how do you handle that? Well, first of all, consider the context that you're talking in. And if you're talking in a large public space, you got to be way careful. It's really different to be in a private setting than to be in some public setting. So are there media around? Are there people, uh, you know, who, are, who have cameras uh, filming you? If so, like, you need to be really careful because just as allies can be really powerful in supporting American Muslims or any other group, we, we can also really do a lot of damage. So don't get over your skis, essentially, to use a metaphor. Um, next, think about the person. Um, is this genuine confusion um, or misinformation that they've experienced? Are they just like trying to play, playing gotcha with you? Um, are they trying to like win a debate, you know, because getting into a debate like that doesn't usually, you know, go anywhere. Um, how hard is their fear? Like, um, how, how powerful is that emotion in them? Um, who else is listening to them? Um, and, and, and who are they kind of in relationship with that has strong feelings about this? And you have to kind of know that before you can consider how to respond. And it's always a judgment call. Like, you're never going to get it right all the time. The first thing you want to do when engaging with a person, after you've kind of thought about them and what they value and what you hold in common, is to meet the emotion, but don't don't repeat the myth. Meet the emotion. So acknowledge or empathize with their emotion, recognize that fear is painful, honor their emotion, honor the values that are kind of underneath that fear, um, but just be human with them like, and, and try to connect with them on that um, because it's really hurt. It really hurts us when fear takes over our lives, right? But don't repeat any negative falsehoods or negative information or assumptions. Like just try to do your best not to do that repeating. Reframe the conversation when necessary. Remember that human minds are built not on logic, but on associations. And you can all remember when Richard Nixon, in response to a question, said, I'm not a crook, right? That's my terrible Richard Nixon impression. 
so what he did when he said that is he actually used associated the word crook with himself. And then that sort of like bought that sort of helped everybody else like associate that further with him. So what you want to do is you want to reframe the issue away from us versus them to as American citizens, for instance, we believe in the religious liberty of all people. We believe in the civil and human rights of everyone. So if you're concerned about Islam and women, like, hey, let's talk about that. The next thing is, like I just did, is to build on shared values. Listen for what they value and then build on that. And if, if there isn't some shared interest immediately that you can figure out some kind of value, then at least find some other shared interest. And, and I've told the story before about Charles being angry about Islam and women when he was taught by a certain news network, Fox News, that Islam and women, uh, you know, Islam treated women poorly. And, uh, and, and as I listened to him, I could recognize the deep values that he had, that in fact I shared, that in fact the Prophet Muhammad and American Muslims share. And so then I was able to tell a positive humanizing story. So one of the great commandments with 10 commandments is thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. But the way to counter false witness is to tell truthful witness. And so remember that the universe, Muriel Ruckheiser says, is made of stories, not atoms. So tell a positive story about American Muslims with around whatever issue that you are, are being addressed with. And if you don't know one right now, that's, that's okay. You can tell that story to that person later and tell specific positive stories and then follow with facts and data. So go to the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, the Southern Poverty Law Center, the Pew Research, um, CARE, all, they all have a lot of great data to share with you that it's honest and true about American Muslims in this country. And that can be really helpful. But remember this, and this is how I'm gonna close, is that human beings change slowly. They often will think about a story or think about a conversation for months and or years. Uh, I know a person who four years ago was really negative toward Muslims. And I just had dinner with him the other day, um, socially distanced and masks and the whole thing. And, um, and he's really changed over those four years because I as an ally have been willing to share positive stories, share my work with them. And it's really changed the conversation, but it takes a long time. And then what, what, but at some point, invite them on a journey with you. You know, so, so invite them to go meet a Muslim, invite them to go to a mosque, invite them to come and meet an imam or some, some Muslim who's really well versed in Islam's teachings. And that way, all the, the craziness of all the websites out there, right, all the hate groups that put up these websites one after another after another, um, will slowly fade away. And that person will begin to change. And then here's the very last thing. Don't try to change anybody. You just try to engage them authentically, respect who they are, figure out if they're persuadable at all, be yourself. But remember that they need to change on their own or God needs to change them. And that's not really up to you. And so you don't have to manipulate them or coerce them or anything else. You're just free to be who you are and engage them in ways that help them uh, to, uh, to become free of the fear that maybe has been infecting their soul, because that's not good for any of us. So Anila, I know we have some time for some Q&A. Are there any questions you'd like to begin to take on right now? Absolutely. Thank you for your, your words there, Reverend Terry. And we do have several questions here. I'll start with the first one that I wanted to address, which is specifically directed to me. It says, uh, please explain why you choose to wear the hijab, uh, the, the head covering. Uh, and, and I love this question. I actually personally chose to start wearing the head covering uh, just a, a few years ago, uh, you know, much later, you know, not right away when I had my spiritual transformation, uh, but much later. And the reason that I chose to start wearing it was actually actually not necessarily because of a religious mandate, but more because the more I learned about Islam, the more proud I was to be a Muslim. And I said, why wouldn't I want to self-identify as a Muslim the very same way that you can see me right now with my Seahawks attire, you know, because it's Sunday football uh, day, uh, because I'm a proud number 12. So it's the very same kind of concept that I'm, it's pride of identity. But it goes well beyond that. It's also about sort of uh, that connectedness with God. Uh, when I wear my, my hijab, it reminds me of a higher purpose for what I'm doing. It gives me that, that constant connection to God and the ability 
in some ways to even be able to do the many difficult mandates and commands that are imposed on us, like the ones we talked about last week, you know, showing forgiveness and kindness, even to those who may say and do horrible things to me, that this gives me that extra oomph, that extra strength. It's like my superwoman cape or something like that. It's a constant reminder of God and a reminder that I'm focusing in life in my relationship with God and how I treat people, not necessarily how they may mistreat me, even if they do. Um, and I will also point out that it is a choice. Uh, in our country, about half of American Muslim women choose to wear a head covering. Uh, my three sisters, none of them wear a head covering. I'm the only one in my family with my, with my mother. I'm the only one of the, the sisters. Um, and, and the Quran is very explicit in saying that there is no compulsion in religion. And that has to do both within the religion and beyond. So there's no compulsion. There's it's not supposed to be any kind of force or, you know, forcing somebody else to do something like wear the head covering. It is supposed to be a choice. But for me, that's what it's about. And it's supposed to be about modesty too. And quickly, I'll just say, share this point about modesty. Uh, that one time in front of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, a man was ogling a woman, like literally ogling this woman. Uh, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, never sort of said things to the, to the woman. Instead, what he did is he turned the man's face away from her, even though she was not necessarily wearing a you know, hijab or anything else like that. The, the onus was on men. The Quran, even when it talks about mod modesty, it addresses men first. So we're all responsible for our own actions. And wearing a head covering or not wearing one is not necessarily a reflection of how religious you are. Uh, there are many people who are far better than I am in terms of their practice and everything else, uh, and they may choose not to wear a head covering, uh, whereas I do, and it's not an indication in that sense at all. It really is and is supposed to be a personal choice. So, Anil, another question that, that uh, Juliana has is, um, we went to a fundraising event at, at an, an Islamic center, and it appeared to her that the is that the imam talked to the men and not to the women and that both were seated separately can you help you know can you help us understand some of that yeah, that's, that's really unfortunate to hear. Uh, I would love to follow up and find out exactly which Islamic center, if it's a local one, I'd love to talk to them uh, because that is definitely not supposed to happen. Uh, unfortunately, this could be yet another manifestation of what I was talking about earlier that despite Islamic teachings, you know, individual Muslims or mis Muslim institutions or Muslim countries at times may not actually follow the actual teachings of Islam. So there is a disparity between what Islam teaches, what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him taught uh, and what Muslims do the very same way again as what Jesus peace be upon him taught is not necessarily what Christians put into practice uh, every single day so I'm very sorry to hear that uh, that is definitely not supposed to happen and if uh, Juliana would be willing to send another message and let us know where this was uh, I would love to follow up on that so uh, one of the questions that was here so someone was talking about and this is just a real general question it sounds like you we see a, a progressive understanding of women's rights across the Abrahamic traditions. Um, can we expand on that just a little bit? And I, and I, what I want to say to that really briefly is, is that it's really important to understand the historical and cultural context of every text uh, that, that, that's written. Um, for instance, so like I said earlier, Jesus not only had women uh, accompany him on his journey around, around um, Israel, um, he also had women that offered money to help support him and his disciples. He had women uh, who were in leadership positions within his own, his own um, uh, uh, community, and he allowed a woman to sit at his feet. And that, of course, that just sounds like a nice euphemistic term, but it actually meant that she was being accepted uh, into his rabbinical school, which meant that she could be a rabbi. And at that time, patriarchy was such that women were not allowed to be teachers, were not allowed to be rabbis, not allowed to do public theology, even though they did plenty of all the teaching uh, in private uh, to their children and to their household. And so, um, and so when, when Martha comes to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, are you sure you wanna do this? Jesus is willing to risk himself and his reputation and his life for that. Um, without understanding and doing the deep study of scripture, with people that are trained and taking advantage of all the scholarship out there, there's no way we'd know that. Well, the same is true when we read the Quran. We have to really understand that this, 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 this document, uh, uh, this, 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 this came up 1400 years ago, was inspired 1400 years ago in a very different culture. And to understand 
any one sentence requires a whole lot of understanding and a lot of support. So as we approach the text, I just encourage us to, to approach these texts with a great deal of humility so that we can understand what was the situation before the text came along and how did it change and transform things afterward. Anila, is there another question you'd like to take on? Well, I just wanted to add a little bit to that before getting to another question, uh, and that is that absolutely, and, and just to be very real here, uh, that there are different perspectives on this. There is a progressive perspective on all of sort of our various religious traditions or faith traditions, and there is a more conservative perspective on it. Uh, and uh, at times throughout history, uh, where those progressive or conservative perspectives have been might have shifted. Uh, they may be very different today than they were before. But one of the things that I find very notable about Islam in particular is, uh, and this is the reason that I even am comfortable considering myself conservative about Islamic uh, religious values, is because if I look back at history, if I look back at Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his teachings, the way he tried to uplift women is really empowering. And it, it would align in a lot of ways with some of the things we talk about when we talk about progressivism or progressive values. Uh, so I actually feel like it, with Islam at least, uh, there was sort of a initial really profound kind of teaching, a revolutionary aspect to the faith tradition uh, that got lost with time. And this is also reveals itself in the fact that it's very hard to find uh, a lot of books, let's say, by female sc Muslim scholars, by by female Muslim jurists. You know, they're not talked about. They're not part of the mainstream narrative. Even people who are in religious spheres of influence today might not know about some of this history. I gave the example of that doctor who wanted to look about, you know, learn about uh, Muslim female scholars and thought there was only going to be about 30 to 40 to write about and walked away with over 8,000. Uh, so that kind of lost history, I think, is something that is missing and has allowed us to really fall into believing a lot of misinformation and not thinking that people like this existed, not knowing that there are these women who were active participants and real game changers when it came not just to their personal lives or their family home lives, but really society on the whole. That made a huge difference. The, I think we have something like one fourth of our religious transmission, of our religious teachings in Islam, you know, sort of the hadith, the sayings and teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, one fourth of them came from women. Women were trusted sources for narration of, of these important religious sort of teachings uh, that were continued on. You know, there was a difference in perspective on things that I feel like, like I said, I, I literally believe that, uh, that Prophet Muhammad would be so disappointed to see what people are doing in his name. And we can come up with so many different examples. I mean, I know somebody was asking or somebody made a question or a point that they find what I was saying to be hard to believe given what they see in terms of realities, uh, various injustices around the world that we see. And I agree with you. I mean, that's part of the problem. So the, the, the problem is twofold. Number one, as I mentioned, is the anti-Muslim industry that is promoting misinformation and trying to paint and portray Islam as sort of uniquely, you know, misogynistic or something. And that is absolutely wrong. Number two, there are actual Muslims, whether Muslim individuals or institutions uh, or, or nation states uh, that don't follow Islamic teachings. And you cannot draw a conclusion about the religion or the source of the religion if you base it just on those conduct of individuals or nation states. The very same way that you can't, you know, we said this last week, you can't look at the KKK and said, oh, that's what, you know, Jesus taught. Like, if anybody did that, you, you would be horrified. You'd say, that's so wrong. And I agree, that is so wrong. The very same way that it's, it's very wrong to draw a conclusion about sort of women's rights when you look at examples of women being treated horribly, you know, by individual Muslims or nation states. You know, we have so many examples, unfortunately, even here in our own country, of women being abused or oppressed or injustices happening. And those are wrong, and we need to work together to combat those forms of injustice. But we cannot, again, sort of demonize an entire faith tradition with misinformation and attribute blame to that faith tradition instead of all of the other problems that we have all around us today with misogyny, with oppression, with injustice that crosses religious lines. You know, one of the, one of the things that, that I learned from, a, from an imam, a imam Jamal Rahman, um, is that when you look at any sacred text, there are some texts that are that are are really very specific 
to the situation. They're, they're addressing one specific problem in a specific cultural context. And then there's, there's more universal sayings or writings in the text. And we often confuse the two. There is, a, a, in this country, um, as I said before, kind of some anti-religious bias, that because religion is talking about the highest values and all of humanity and trying to strive for truth, there's also kind of, a, of, a, of an anger that religion like can't stop people from doing bad things. And, and, uh, um, and really, I think all of our faith traditions recognize that people have free will and make choices and get wrapped up and do, and do, uh, do bad things be, uh, based on, on what they're believing in and seeing in the world. Um, but there's also, in all of our traditions, uh, a move of God to, to call us back to our humanity, to our common humanity, and, and to live out those values. I think also that wisdom traditions in general, part of the strength of them is that they actually remember the mistakes they've made. I mean, I think that that's a good thing. But sometimes, and this is especially true of some Christians with respect to our Jewish neighbors, we're really hard on our Jewish neighbors because of some mistakes that they've made, forgetting that one of their great wisdoms is to remember the mistakes so that then they won't repeat them again. And so we get so hard on each other. And part of it is that we only hear the negative. You know, we don't, we don't hear about the positive things Roman Catholics are doing. We don't hear the things that our Jewish neighbors are doing or Lutherans are doing or Muslims are doing. We don't hear those positive things because only the, only the bad news makes the news. And so we have to really step back from all that negativity and begin to get to know people and see the ways that they are contributing to the world in which we live. Yeah, and I wanted to address some, uh, another point too, and this is this idea of like, we have to be willing to look at why people are uh, promoting certain narratives. Uh, oftentimes, the people that are promoting a, a sort of attack on Islam and women's rights, they may not necessarily care about women's rights. I mean, sometimes some of these groups are literally the same ones that are actually attacking women's rights in our country and elsewhere. But the purpose for using women's rights is a way to attack the religion and attack Muslims in our country. That remember that and also to sort of win over support for certain decisions, political decisions, uh, particularly when it comes to foreign policy. I remember this uh, specifically around sort of the, the invasion and the war against Afga you know, in Afghanistan, uh, where for the, you know, to try to win support for that war, all of a sudden there was this, you know, cry for saving Afghan women. Well, Afghan women are not going to be saved by bombing them. And yet that was a solution because all of a sudden let's attack Islam and say how wrong that is so that we could go in and bomb a country uh, and, and cause horrific damage. And not only that, destroy the very same institutions that could otherwise be in place to protect women in Afghanistan or elsewhere. And that's what we've seen a lot of throughout history as well. So we really have to understand the rationale that's being used oftentimes or the reason that's motivating people to, to promote certain narratives. And I'll add to that point, you know, if, if you're given an option, one option is the narrative that I share today about what Islam teaches about women's rights. Another option is the narrative that a lot of you see on, let's say, mainstream you know, media or Hollywood or the ones that are promoted by the anti-Muslim industry. If you're given those two options, which one would you want to uplift and amplify and have more and more people around the world see as reality? Like, let's think about it that, you know, purely from our own self-interested perspective. Wouldn't it make more sense to promote this and not allow this other narrative that is competing, you know, with this narrative? Wouldn't it make more sense to help uplift certain voices, certain messages, and have more actual everyday Muslim women in particular out there sharing what they believe, what they think, what motivates them, what inspires them, what liberates them, rather than telling women like me, for instance, I've been told this, that I should take off my head covering because that would liberate me. That is certainly not liberation for me or other Muslim women, right? The ultimate reality is that liberation is about choice the choice to get to make these decisions for ourselves, And nobody stripping me of my choice to wear the clothing that I choose to wear is truly liberating me. You know, you can dislike my hijab, just like I may dislike somebody's t-shirt for whatever it might have on it. But at the end of the day, 
that's the beauty of the right to choose. We get to choose what we wear. That's what ultimately, you know, uh, women's rights for me is about is women's choice. Whether they choose to wear a burqa, a bikini, a hijab, you know, a t-shirt, whatever it is, it ultimately boils down to women's choice. That's what I advocate for. That's what I strive to struggle every day, both within the Muslim community and beyond, because it is both an internal and external uh, ongoing struggle that we have to have. Anila, thank you so much. And, and uh, I, don't, I don't see any other questions at the moment. Oh, I, I, wait, I, I do see one. Um, uh, Karen asked, I'd like to join an interfaith women's group. Where can I find such groups? Thank you for this series. Uh, you know, Karen, I just want to say, um, uh, if you, um, if you would, would contact me, um, I'd be happy to try to help you figure that out. Uh, Terry at paths2understanding.org, I'm happy to help you with that. And I love that question. Yes, we need more of those. It is hard right now with COVID and with the lack of opportunities to get together. Uh, but there are still groups that I think are meeting on Zoom at least. And there are ways to connect and learn from each other. And something that I've always heard people say, especially those who had never even met a Muslim before, and they get into these interfaith uh, women gathering or, or just interfaith spaces in general, they always talk about how much they've learned that they have in common. And I, I hope and think that that's also going to be your experience, Karen. Yeah, and I just want to, to add, like, we're in such a divisive time, friends. You know, everybody is, feels so divided, and, and, and there's so much negative energy about, about each other. I believe that wisdom communities of all kinds, including atheists, agnostics, and humanists, and, and philosophy groups, and whatever, like, when we're able to come together and work for the common good together, um, and, and respect each other's differences and, and strive for truth together. Um, I think that's really powerful. And I think those communities can be really powerful in helping to heal, be a part of healing the country from the division that we're seeing sown over and over again on Facebook and, and, uh, and other social media and by politicians. Like we've got to come together locally and we're not going to get a lot of news about it. You know, the news, the news cameras aren't going to come. Um, I was part of a, new, of, a, of a really beautiful event once, and all the imagery behind what we were doing was all of violence. It wasn't about the peace that we were talking about in the room. But it's, it becomes real, real for those communities, and it becomes powerful there, and it's transformative for all of us. So I really encourage you and others to reach out and to find those, those uh, multi-faith connections so that we can recognize each other's humanity. So we just want to thank you all for, for being with us today. Um, Anila, do you want to add anything else before we go? Well, I just wanted to point out that next week we're going to be talking about what is Sharia. Again, another instance of a word that people don't know, an Arabic word that is given certain meaning by anti-Muslims uh, and often used as, as scaremongering and fear-mongering. Uh, so we will look at what is Sharia exactly, how do we get a better understanding of it. Uh, but we are so grateful to all of you for joining us for this series. Uh, it is always an honor to be with my dear brother, Reverend Terry, as well as today with my dear sisters, uh, Rabbi Johanna and Reverend Dr. Kelly. Uh, and we look forward Forward to having you join us next week to talk about Sharia uh, and the week after is going to be Islam and other faith traditions. So join us for these final two. We hope you enjoy today's session. Uh, I see that the Seahawks did win as well. So go Hawks. Uh, and I'm very excited to, to continue this conversation next week. Peace be, peace be, be with you all. Yes, thank you so much. Bye. Bye now.